Okay, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining the December 17th uh, Citizen Oversight Board meeting. Um, we have an awesome agenda today and are joined by guests from um, Denver Health, um, and we are pleased to welcome you to our meeting. Um, we'll go through some board updates and business quickly, um, and then we'll pretty much turn it over to um, our, our Denver Health colleagues for um, some discussion following up. Um, a meeting we had a few weeks ago where uh, I think the board became aware of what we didn't know about the relationship between um, the uh, Denver Sheriff's Department and Denver Health and just wanting to really have a conversation, friendly conversation about, um, you know, how that relationship works and um, the, the work policy, et cetera, that, that Denver Health uses to set um, kind of the healthcare uh, standards for, um, for that department. So we'll get into that. And then um, we've got any community members who are interested in speaking. Um, you can uh, let Daniel um, know and he can put you on the agenda as well. Um, so with that, let me just pull up our uh, board business. So a few things. Um, wanted to update the board on. Um, we are continuing um, our conversations with um, the recruiter uh, around a recruitment for the um, independent monitor. Um, we have a meeting on the 21st. The um, selection committee has a meeting on the 21st to work through uh, the proposed slate of um, candidates. Uh, so what happened was the recruiting firm got all these resumes. They also did um, a reach out uh, nationwide. I think they reached out to 60 different individuals who serve in similar capacities elsewhere and um, hope to recruit that way as well. Um, certain people applied. They've gone through three rounds of um, connecting with um, eligible, you know, appropriate candidates. Um, so that includes a writing sample, direct interviews, um, and some conversations about, you know, interest in the role and fit, etc. Then they're going to come to us with um, two <laughs> top ten candidates. Um, and uh, are going to go through kind of what they call a binder. Um, so a pretty detailed set of information about each candidate. So we actually have three hours of meetings on the 21st to go through um, those candidates. And then from those candidates, the board will select, or sorry, the board, the selection committee will pick, you know, top candidates to interview. And then from there, we'll recommend three candidates uh, to the board and then we'll we'll take it from there. Um, I'm I'm very interested in um, reviewing some of those candidates. I've, I've gotten a sneak peek at the list and um, lots of really interesting experience uh, that we can apply to uh, city of Denver. As folks know, it's also a very strange time to be recruiting and hiring. Um, in my, you know, work life, my actual job, um, you know, we have positions open for longer, almost twice as long as normal, and, um, you know, it's a it's a uh, candidate's world uh, right now from a um, hiring standpoint. Um, so it's it's also a, a pretty unique time to be hiring for this pretty unique role. So I think, um, you know, managing community expectations about that. What we're committed to as well as a board is, you know, if we don't feel like we find someone that's a fit, we will re-recruit. Um, so we're trying to, you know, proceed uh, efficiently um, and get to candidates, but we also want to make sure that we've got the right candidate for the role. Um, I have also begun a number of community meetings uh, with organizations around town who may have an interest in um, participating in the you know, public engagement part of this and are starting to um, get ideas and best practices about um, how we want to do that. Um, if anyone on the board is particularly interested in that activity, um, would love to engage you in those conversations as well. Um, in general, uh, a goal of mine, and I wanted to run this by the board and, and make sure folks are also uh, in agreement, 
uh, is to take, you know, sort of a wide net big tent approach and um, really engage as many community based organizations as we can um, and community leaders in, in the area to make sure that we've got um, as broad a set of stakeholders um, engaging in this process as possible. Um, in some initial meetings, what we're looking at is a combination of public forums and um, in-person public forums and, and online um, and are trying to balance, you know, time of day um, and day of the week such that, you know, people can really participate. Um, so more to come on that. Um, I have a meeting in mid-January with a few community organizations to um, start to sort of frame up what that community engagement can look like. Um, I think I sent a note to the board and maybe I sent a note to the board in my mind about the organizations I've worked uh, to reach out to so far. Um, and so if you didn't receive that note, please let me know and I will uh, actually send a real email. Um, and, um, you know, I, I think at this point, um, any organization is a great fit for the work we're doing that is interested in this. So um, I'll, I'll stop talking. Uh, thoughts from the board on that. Um, I didn't receive a list of the community folks. And so if you'd uh, send that. I will take it as an action item. Thank you. Great. Yeah, Julia, thank you so much for all of your um, hard work and, and the time <laughs> that you're committing to, to this effort. That's considerable. I mean, three hour meeting, my goodness, um, on top of everything else for just this one thing. So thank you. Um, I, I think it's wonderful to be um, thoughtful about how we engage the community and, and I guess getting their feedback on, you know, kind of what process they want. I, I have a more um, I guess, technical or administrative question, which is sort of, you know, is it the selection committee that has the, the responsibility to, quote, engage in the community process, or is that, does that fall on the board? Do you know? I haven't looked at the ordinance in a while, so. Um, in asking the selection committee, it was something they could not commit to uh, due to the level of activity um, that this requires and sort of the timing of it. Um, and so uh, I believe that falls back to the board at this point. Right, right. Okay, that's, I, I understand. And I, I, can't, I can't remember, I should know this because I've looked at the ordinance many times, but also I know it's changed. But um, I, I feel like we maybe want to think about what we think kind of satisfies you know, that, that obligation kind of legally, but then also I, I think I appreciate your efforts to connect with, different organizations and get their their input. Um, I, I want to I just don't want the process to get drawn out too far with, um, you know, so if we can think of I, I, I recall like last when when the past monitor Nick Mitchell was appointed, I, I think there was like a community meeting uh, or maybe there were multiple. It was um, just one. There were two. Yeah, Greg. he told me one when I met with him. But Greg, if oh, you yeah. remember two, maybe he forgot one. So there <laughs> were, but it wasn't many, right? It wasn't like six weeks worth of community meetings. Um, and because the position is going to be public, right? And these candidates in participating in these public meetings will then, you know, their employers will know that they're applying for a new jobs. So we we do need that to be tight. I think the goal would be over, you know, two days or something like that, right. um, rather right, than. Right. Okay. Yeah. And then um, when you say online process, um, I'm, I'm sort of a, I'm, it's hard for me to visualize. Are you thinking it's sort of just soliciting questions or, or allowing these people to, to be online to, to field questions in, in person or, you know what I mean? Like a zoom kind of thing. What, yeah, what do you a, mean a by online? Kind of mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Um, that's as far as the conversation has gotten so far. I think it's not the best forum for something like that, but in light of COVID and to create one more maybe accessible option for folks, um, you know, some in-person meetings, some online meetings may get us the widest net. Cool. Um, That's great. But just the, the how of that all, like no details, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other thoughts on that? 
Um, so the next related item is. Oh, sorry. One yep. other thing. Wait, I just had, Great. I did have another thought. Is, um, I, kn I know that we sort of had a list of different community organizations. I'm, I'm happy to reach out to any organizations. And I guess I would ask, you know, Julia is really undertaken a lot of effort here. So if we could pitch in and, you know, help her with reaching out to community organizations, I feel like that's not, you know, too big of a lift for us. I mean, you know, each of us could take a couple um, to reach out to. Um, that that would be, I'm willing to do that. And I, I guess I'm asking fellow board members if you would also do that. Maybe Daniel, you could just assign them, you know, like reach out to these three. I see nod, so I mean, unless anyone objects, that would right. be my suggestion. I mean, once we have a plan of action in terms of how we're going to do the community engagement, you know, we, I guess, are you saying, Katina, soliciting, let, just letting them know in advance that we're going to be soliciting their input or actually giving them the details of, you know, when we're going to hold these Zoom calls slash meetings? I think that Julie is in the process right now of soliciting input. Is that right, Julie? That's right. Yeah, I think right. if community organizations want to participate in the planning of that engagement, that's great. Um, you know, community led on that, I think, is going to be meaningful. Um, and then, of course, letting people know that it's happening also matters. Mm -hmm. So, right. So, I think it's an initial touch, like like now, right? That we would all kind of contact two or three organizations. Hey, we're from COB. Uh, there's there's this process that we're trying to develop. Um, there's, you know, do you have any thoughts or input? Do you want to have any input in how this gets created? Uh, and by the way, we're going to be having it. So, hopefully, you can join. I mean, I don't okay. think it's a uh, very involved. But if we could divvy that up and carry the load, that would be great. I think. Agree. Thank you for that um, suggestion. The the other talking point too is, um, you know, this is an American Idol where everybody gets a vote and then we just you know text in and you know whoever gets the most text votes wins, right? Um, this is a feedback and engagement, right? Getting a sense of how these folks read in the community, right? So this is an input to the board's process, and so if you have thoughts on the kinds of feedback specifically we want um, from candidates uh, or from community members about candidates, that's also important thinking. Um, you know, what can help us make a, a good decision on this? Um, and, and for those members who are new, um, you know, those community forums or the community forum, whichever it was in the past, um, <laughs> is, was actually the differentiator um, in candidates last time. So, um, you know, it is it is an important um, thing for us in terms of that feedback. Um, I wanted to open the conversation up as well. I know I had proposed a hiring committee in our last meeting. I think that was met, met with, you know, sort of mixed reaction. And so wanted to close out the conversation about that today. Um, I know Nikki isn't able to join us, our, our fellow board member. Um, and, and she sort of felt like that wasn't living up to the community's expectation of the board stepping into this role. Um, so wanted to get that out there as sort of the first, um, first thought on this. Um, but, you know, again, I'll open it up to board discussion on this. I agree with Nikki. Yeah, I, I generally agree with Nikki. I think that if every board member, every board member should make the time to participate. Um, you know, this is our charge. This is what we ought to do. But I cert if there was a board member or two that was unable to make, you know, a, a, a meeting or, you know, one of the meetings, one of the interviews or whatever, I would not hold that up. I mean, I think you know, the, we want to have a situation where the vast majority of board members participated in the interviews of each of these three candidates. Um, and if for some reason we couldn't get, you know, eight out of eight or nine out, whatever it is, then we would we would still move forward. Okay, so that sounds pretty much like consensus on a no uh, hiring committee. It'll be a full committee of the board. Um, that's great. Uh, what I'll ask Daniel to do then in anticipation of um, our interviews is start to just grab blocks of time on people's calendars. Um, and if it's okay, you know, maybe the eight to nine time frame and the noon to one. Um, so we could potentially do it before meetings start and then during our typical lunch-ish hour. 
Um, does that feel okay to folks? And maybe grabbing like six slots. Um, okay. And then um, we will do uh, a meeting to coalesce our thinking after all the candidates, and then perhaps one to align before we do our interviews. So um, look out for your calendar to get totally sucked up by that. Um, I'll also say that I met with the hiring committee last week to talk through the rubric um, that uh, we put together and was in the posting. Um, and so if you haven't seen that in your email, you have access to basically what's a spreadsheet. And I took uh, kind of the capabilities, job skills, knowledge out of the position posting that the recruiter created and took what April had sent around that we created last year, looking at the competency areas and sort of compared them um, and made sure that everything was covered. There were kind of three critical gap areas uh, that I highlighted in there. So uh, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion was not necessarily called out in the posting and was obviously important to us. Um, project management and um, somebody who can negotiate through um, disagreement. Um, and so I added some sentences in there that probably do a bad job in describing those things. But if you wanted to add more in there on those and have that be added to our full rubric, that's great. Um, so I gave comment access because there's no version control in um, a spreadsheet. Um, and so just add in your comments and I can add it into the consolidated document. Does that sound okay? Okay. All right. Um, Daniel, is there any other board business that we needed to cover? Yeah, I can just cover a few quick hits. Um, I don't know if all of the board is aware, <clears throat> uh, but Executive Director of Public Safety Murphy Robinson uh, recently announced his resignation uh, just on Monday, I believe, of this week. Um, he will be resigning effective early January. We do not have a specific date at this time. Um, he and uh, Armando, uh, the one of his deputies, uh, did uh, email uh, Julia and, and I reaffirming uh, their commitment to implement the, or to follow through on, on the commitments that he made to us uh, in our last meeting. Uh, so there is at least willingness there, um, although it does appear as though some of those commitments are, are gonna be pretty, it's gonna be pretty tight uh, to try to get them all done uh, prior to uh, whenever he leaves in early January. So I just wanted to make sure that was on the board's radar. We have, I have a short update from the uh, Citizen Oversight Board nominating committee. They did send uh, their first slate of three candidates to city council uh, almost two weeks ago. So last uh, previous Monday of last week. Um, so, so city council from that date has 45 days to make a selection or to return the slate uh, to the committee uh, and basically decline to pick any of them. Uh, so we're two weeks into that almost. Uh, so hopefully we will see um, some progress there. Uh, and get the first board vacancy filled. Um, once city council makes a decision, uh, the nominee committee will then uh, create and submit a second slate. Uh, so any viewers, uh, the second position is still available uh, and applications will still be considered until, um, until they submit that second slate. So they, yes, um, relatedly, uh, one of the members of the nominating committee, uh, Reverend Dr. Kay Farley, has offered her resignation as well. Um, she's going to be moving to Israel uh, in mid-January. Uh, and so she will no longer be able to serve on the nominating committee. Um, and so we are uh, working, she was a mayoral appointee uh, to the nominating committee and uh, we're working on we're uh, filling that position, uh, but I do not believe that that the second slate will be delayed uh, because of that. Uh, I don't have all the details, but I think the goal is, uh, if possible, to get the second slate sent before her departure, um, and if not, uh, 
barring uh, some sort of dead, a one-one deadlock, um, I believe the nominee committee it is hoping to still move forward with that um, as expeditiously as possible. Um, and let's see what else was there. There's one I want. Um, we did get, I think, lastly, uh, we did receive, and I sent, I forwarded last Friday to you uh, the final documents from the sheriff. Uh, regarding food service. And that was, so it was with monthly food service reports for September and October um, that we had requested. So he has uh, fully responded to all of our outstanding requests uh, related to that. So I believe that's all that I have. Daniel, I have a point of clarification. Yes. So if Dr. Farley leaves, it will probably almost certainly leave before the second slate is submitted, that wouldn't slow down a, sec a second slate being submitted by two. You don't need a full nominating committee to do that. Is that what you're saying? That appears to be the case, or at least the inclination right now. Uh, the, the thing is the, the ordinance is not clear as to whether or not a full nominating committee is needed. Uh, the ordinance is clear on, um, is a little bit more clear on the timelines. And so the, especially if the two agree, um, even if there was a third, you know, it, it wouldn't make a difference. I think if, if the two deadlock, then it would cause complications. Okay. Thank you. That's my understanding of it. We'll Thanks. get new members eventually. <laughs> so hopefully in, 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 a, in a, I mean, if things proceed, we should have a new member, uh, by January, and then a new another the second position would be filled either I would assume late February, mid to mid March, somewhere in there. Great. Okay. Um, the last thing is uh, voting on approving the minutes from our previous meeting. If folks had a chance to read them uh, and don't have any edits, go ahead. So moved. Second. Great. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Okay, the motion passes. Uh, with that, uh, I would love to welcome, although you've been watching us do board business, so apologies about that, our Denver Health uh, colleagues. Um, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourselves and your roles, we can um, get into the conversation. Um, I know we submitted uh, some questions in advance. The, the purpose of those questions was really just to help frame the conversation and, and help you all kind of understand where we you know, wanted to kind of dig into to knowledge with you. Um, if you have any prepared remarks or you know things you want to cover before we get into questions, I'm happy to proceed that way. I'm, I'm pretty open on um, how this meeting can flow. So I'll, I'll turn it over to you if you, you want to kind of introduce um, yourselves and we can go from there. Sure, thank you. Um, I'm Jackie Zelesniak. I'm the Director of Government Relations at Denver Health um, and I'm here with Mark and I'll let him introduce himself. Yeah, hi. Um, it's a privilege of being here with everybody on a, a Friday morning. So I'm one of the Associate Chief Operating Officers, um, and uh, part of my areas of oversight includes um, our relationship with the Sheriff's Department, as well as uh, multiple other services that we provide to the city. So it's, uh, it's a privilege to be here this morning. And um, part of my role is I act as the official liaison between Denver Health and Hospital Authority and all public entities and elected officials. Um, and so um, I did want to thank you all knowing um, that sometimes public service is challenging and I don't think we thank folks enough. Um, and I just wanted to thank you because it's, uh, I think you picked a really important area to spend your time on and we are thankful for that. I did actually have one clarifying question first um, because the questions that you sent over had some different terminology for I thought what was the same population. And so I don't want to misspeak knowing that I don't have the background in corrections and criminal justice that many of you probably do. So I'd like some clarification as to the terms um, and truly like, I mean, this is just me being type A Virgo, right? Of I'd like some clarity into the terms of if you'd like to me to refer to individuals as inmate or detainees, and if there's a difference between the two, um, and I will do my best, but I also just don't wanna like steamroll something that I don't understand. Uh, do board members have perspectives on that? 
I think um, our intention was to speak broadly about those who are in the care or custody okay. of the sheriff's department, whether that's as a full-time uh, participant or um, you know, in transition between facilities or awaiting trial or you know, there's lots of circumstances. So um, from my perspective, as broad as possible, um, especially considering the uh, community members experience uh, that brought this to light was actually someone who was in transition between facilities. So um, I, I think all of the above is of interest to me. Do, do other board members agree with that? Okay. Well, I will do my best um, and appreciate any grace if I stumble over terminology, but that's not my intent. Um, I also, before I get to, I have a little like introductory piece um, that I'd like to say, but you also brought up you know, the, um, I guess the lack of clarity around the relationship between Denver Health and Hospital Authority and the Denver Sheriff's Office. And that wasn't actually one of the questions. Um, so I just wanna touch on that briefly to start off um, because Denver Health and Hospital Authority became a political subdivision of the state in 1997 through state statute. And so when that happened, we were no longer a city agency and we are, um, a separate public entity. Now the relationship, we still have a relationship with the city um, and with uh, almost all city agencies, just like we have a relationship with other community organizations and contractors and businesses throughout the city. The relationship with Denver Sheriff's Office is actually a contractual relationship done through the annual operating agreement that is approved by city council every year. Um, and so there is a longstanding process for all of the contracted elements within that. Uh, it is a cost-based contract um, to provide all of the healthcare services, but that is a contract that is negotiated annually with members of the Denver Sheriff's Department, um, and then again, approved by Denver City Council. So that's how that relationship, um, it kind of works on the business operational level. Um, so Denver Health, we are the primary safety net institution within Denver, and we like to think within Colorado. For 160 years, we've been providing health care to vulnerable populations in Denver, in the Denver area, and we provide that health care without consideration of the ability to pay. Denver Health is a comprehensive, integrated organization providing high quality health care for all. More than 25% of all Denver residents receive their health care at Denver Health. We provided billions of dollars in uncompensated care to the residents of Colorado, and we are an essential integrated high efficient high quality healthcare system providing healthcare in the jail setting is a natural extension of the Denver health mission we are grateful for our long standing and collaborative relationship with the Denver sheriff's office and with sheriff diggins um, and are here today in support of that partnership i think based on what uh, the chair has said i will just start going through the questions um, that daniel ginstuden had sent us and please feel free to interrupt me at any time. Um, and then if there are additional questions, we will do our best to get you answers. That's great. If you could also say the question that you're answering, we didn't <laughs> publish those to the community, for example. So just so people know what you're responding to. That's great. Yeah, okay. Happy to. Um, the first question was, what are Denver Health's primary goals and priorities when treating inmates at the Denver Sheriff Department facilities? Our primary goal when treating inmates at the Denver Sheriff's Department is to provide high quality whole person health care. We are the contracted entity to provide all medical services at the Denver County Jail and the Denver City Jail. Um, the Denver Jail Health Care has been continually accredited by the National Commission on Correctional Care, the NCCHC, since 1982 and complies with the American Correctional Association, ACA, standards. Um, the Denver Jails is often looked to as a leader in providing high quality health care to those services within jails nationwide. The capacity of the Denver of the downtown Denver Detention Center is 1500 inmates and the capacity at the Denver County Jail is 850 inmates. Um, it, I bring those numbers up because we are responsible for care of all of those individuals um, An average uh, about 100 and 75 to 180 patients in the county jail and 971 uh, daily patients seen um, in the Denver Detention Center. Throughout our dedicated physicians, nurses, and providers, we oversee all on site healthcare services and try to meet the healthcare needs of each individual. Of course, the healthcare needs of a particular patient, um, when the, I'm sorry, when the, Healthcare needs of a particular patient 
can exceed what can be accommodated on site, inmates are transferred to a local hospital for care. Through the services at DDC and Denver County Jail, with this, in full support and partnership with the Sheriff's Office, Denver Health is able to provide whole person health care, including behavioral health and addiction services. At that in many instances is greater than what many inmates, <coughs> excuse me, access when outside the jail setting. Feedback we have received is that very few jails across the nation have the high level and quality of care that which we are providing through that contracted partnership with the Denver Sheriff's Office. I'll move on to the second question unless there are questions on that. Um, the second question was who creates- Actually, there, it's okay. Don't worry, I'll, 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 I'll wait. Okay. Okay. Um, the second question was who creates and changes detainee treatment policies and are the policies public? So our policies are not public. Um, none of our medical policies as a healthcare institution are public, whether we're talking about correctional care or general care provided in any of our outpatient clinics or, or inpatient hospital environments. Um, who creates the policies are that um, our physicians work with the Denver Sheriff Office to inform what we believe to be appropriate medical standards of care for patients. Um, and those are agreed upon um, in partnership with the Denver Sheriff's Office. I, I guess I would just add a, a editorial comment as it relates to that as, as part of our uh, accreditation through uh, NCCHC. Um, they require that we submit those policies and also review those for national compliance and standards across the board. Um, and I think that's an important note, just so, you know, it's not just a localized, you know, we have some of our medical providers as well as the sheriff's department, you know, kind of, you know, making it up as it relates to just, you know, our unique situations, but they really are based upon and reviewed by, you know, national standards in that environment. And so that would be the only editorial comment. Okay, the third, the third. question. I, um, so in, in situations where you have uh, the participation of physicians by particular inmates who are uh, giving information about the condition and medication of their patients, do you include them in your consideration and your decision making about treatment for that particular inmate? Yeah, so that's an excellent question. So it is um, longstanding clinical practice that the provider will take all of the information that they can get uh, either from the patient or from those patients external providers and take that into consideration as they create that individualized treatment plan for that patient. Okay. Yeah, and, and I think, thank you for bringing that up. And, and uh, this is um, re really kind of flowing as a natural dialogue. Uh, I think that for the record was uh, question number four um, as it relates to how, how do we consider the input and relationship with um, uh, care providers outside of the jail settings. Okay. Um, and I'll, so I'll actually just jump to question number four because question number three was asking if we made a distinction between short-term and long-term detainees. And the answer is we treat, um, we don't really make a distinction. We treat everyone with the same standard practice um, regardless of their length of stay. So question number four, speaking to that uh, prior conversation, was how do medical staff take into account prior diagnosis and treatment decisions made by the outside physician? So every inmate receives a medical behavioral health screening based on NCCHC standards at intake upon being booked into the jail. We have a patient informed process, which includes having the patient fill out a request of information to contact or release of information to contact their providers to allow us to gather the important medical information that is used to guide their care in the jails. Our providers are trained medical professionals that use all information to make the best treatment path for the patient in front of them. I will caveat that of we ask the patient to provide a release of information. We, we don't mandate that they do. We can't make them do that. And we are only allowed to use the information that they provide us. Um, and so we do our best with the information that they provide us. I have a question. What if there's a disagreement between uh, how a how somebody should be treated by the 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 outside um, practitioner and and the and the uh, treating physician at Denver Health is there follow up is there continued dialogue? Yeah, so I think um, the best way to answer that question is I think most times, much like you know those in the legal profession, 
you can have four attorneys in a room and you'll get six opinions, right? So, uh, you know, medical care is not actually dissimilar. Many providers treat patients uh, with different points of view and different clinical experiences. And so our providers are in the circumstance where they have an individual in front of them. They have had, hypothetically, they've had conversations with that patient's outside providers. They have that patient's medical history from those outside pharmacies. And they are then making the best decision based on the inmate's current state at that time, as well as the current environment that that individual is in. Yeah, and it's interesting that, you know, bring that up because I think it's an important uh, di dialogue, um, you know, uh, through the NCCHC standards, they actually um, have an official role within each medical facility and a correctional facility with which they uh, deem as the responsible physician. So it is that provider who um, uh, the person in custody is in um, under their responsibility in terms of the overall medical care at that time while they're in custody. But if the if the person who's responsible for that care while you know while somebody is in custody takes a different treatment approach than the outside provider, is that communicated back to the outside provider to have further dialogue, or is the decision simply made? I understand, you know, based on perhaps different circumstances, go in a different direction and there's no further dialogue with the outside provider to get any further input. Yeah, I, I think um, the answer to the question is, I mean, we're trying to really, you know, um, um, rather than kind of say who gets to call what shots, I mean, it really is a collaborative in the environment with which we're, we're trying to really care for everybody in it, who is in custody is in the spirit of collaboration and, and, and communication back and forth, really to really t take care of the needs uh, of the person who's being treated within the jail setting. And so um, that flow of information most certainly is intended to be back and forth. And, and if there's a disagreement, you know, um, obviously, you know, the, the, those pop up from time to time, but um, well, it, it, if the question is, you know, are we intending to do that and maintain that open dialogue? The short answer is absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would certainly hope that there is collaboration, um, but, and, and, but I, I'm just trying to say, in those instances where there may be a disagreement, that there, I'm just stressing that there ought to be continuing collaboration, because maybe there's something the outside provider isn't aware of, that you want to bring to his or her attention, et cetera, and I think that continuing dialogue could help. Yeah, and I don't, I don't think our, I mean, I've worked at Denver Health a little over nine years now, and our providers are not shy at asking for what they need, especially when it comes in the form of information. Um, and, and to that note, and, and I guess, you know, um, kind of like painting this overall picture, I mean, we, we really are, you know, looking at the care of everybody who's in custody to what happens, you know, once that person leaves that, that environment, right? And so therefore, you know, the need to be able to like have those dialogues and those transitions. Um, we're not just looking at their care as it relates to, oh, what's happening in the jails at that point in time, but what are the next steps, you know, should they um, be released and then um, engage back with their providers in the community. And so um, that really is the spirit with which we, we approach e each and every one of these, these situations. Thank you. The fifth question we were asked uh, said, can you speak to the approach of supporting those in custody who are on MAT, medication assisted therapy for opioid disorders? Protocols are in place for patients that are at risk for withdrawal of alcohol, opiates, and or benzodiazepines. During all intake screenings, nursing, pa nursing staff ask patients about their patient history of substance abuse and or any withdrawal system symptoms, including a history of seizures. Patient symptoms and vital signs are assessed at intake and at frequent intervals. Patients are, that are currently in a registered methadone program will be followed in accordance with policies and procedures of the Denver Health Behavioral Health Methadone Program. Patients experiencing severe or progressive intoxication overdose or severe alcohol and or sedative withdrawal are transferred immediately via ambulance to Denver Health. Patients who are in... Um, I'm sorry, if the patient has not, if a patient is enrolled in a current methadone program that has been verified by the OBHS at Denver Health, and that patient has not missed more than three days of dosing, their methadone is continued for administration in the jail. Buprenorphine can be continued if verified as current. Um, 
sorry. Buprenorphine can be continued um, if verifies in, as current as administered in the community within seven days. Methadone is only three days. That shorter timeline for methadone is a national standard followed by methadone clinics. Staff also utilize the PDMP, the Prescription Drug Monitoring Program, to obtain collateral information on most recent controlled substance prescription to provide a better overview into any um, medication withdrawals that we may be seeing. Oh, Julia, you're muted. I pushed on mute, but I didn't unmute. Um, so what you're saying is if the person is on methadone, their methadone is only continued for three days? Yes, so it's a clinical taper, which is the best practice in correctional settings, which is what we follow. And I just had a brief question too. You know, I know we have a lot of individuals who come into um, jails or correctional settings who are in crisis or incapacitated. Um, and if a person's unable to uh, speak for themselves or advocate for themselves, like how does that protocol kind of differ? Um, I think mainly just thinking about how do like friends and family kind of support when they know a person is incarcerated through this process? Yeah, so we will we will take we will collect information that is given to us as long as we have the ability the ability from the person to ask for that information. If the person is unable to give us the ability to ask for that information, a lot of times we rely on our clinical standards and our clinical testings to try to figure out what is going on, um, and then provide the best treatment based on that. Thank you. I had a quick question just to, to clarify. You mentioned something about um, the national standards. I think you said four corrections. So are, are they different um, for outside of a correctional setting in terms of the amount of time that a person is on? So I, so if I believe that there is much more latitude in medical practice if you are treating someone that is not in a correctional facility. I think there are inherent risks um, potentially in treating folks um, in a correctional facility, especially um, on some of these you know, medicated assisted treatments, which is why we try to provide the compassionate care to not completely stop someone's withdrawal protocol and do a clinical taper um, that's clinically monitored. Um, but again, if you are not in a correctional facility, you have a lot more latitude into your withdrawal treatment program that you would be in. So, so, so point of cl clarification, uh, Julie, so um, I, I need to clarify, if somebody is verified that they are, example, on methadone, um, and they have not missed it more than three days. Um, we will continue those services within the jail. We do provide methadone dosing in the jail. And, and for somebody who's been involved in, you know, kind of like the operations of the jail for some time, um, this is an area that we've advanced, you know, over the last several years, um, probably better than, than, than most uh, correctional care settings. We, we have um, a MAP program that is designated for the jails. We have an actual MAP program. We, we, we have an assessment on that. We um, take people's vital signs. We understand where they're at in the community with everything that Jackie had just said. And that's being led by, quite frankly, um, one of our addiction psychiatrists oversight of that program. And so with that being said, um, it's a really robust program where, and if we were having this conversation, I'd say even five to seven years ago, um, there was tremendous opportunity. And so this has been an area, given the feedback that we've gotten from, you know, obviously the opioid epidemics in the community, so on and so forth. Um, this is something that we've really um, been very mindful of and making sure that, you know, people's treatment um, who desperately need this treatment is continued to where appropriate in the jail. Um, That's helpful. Um, I am not a doctor and I have read a book on uh, this topic, um, so that is the extent of my knowledge. But the book I read uh, was extensively researched and suggested that, you know, the best way for MAT to be successful is continuing that therapy, maybe the patient's entire life. Um, and so 
I, I, and um, what I also know to be true is that a, a significant number of overdoses come when people are um, weaned from treatment or enter um, corrections, you know, uh, reduce their tolerance uh, for opioids or, or other drugs, leave care uh, or custody, um, and then take a dose that they used to take but are not, um, you know, sort of acclimated to that dose anymore. So I just wonder, you know, how, how is your thinking advancing um, to, to the point you've just made, you know, um, this is different than seven years ago, even MAT is, you know, um, increasing in its receptivity in the medical community, et cetera. But um, can you speak a little bit to like, what are your thoughts on that? Are, are we creating, um, you know, circumstances for folks that are more dangerous when they leave their our custody if we're sort of weaning them off those treatments? And you know, is that maybe a perspective you agree with, or um, something that you know is is changing perhaps in your protocols? Yeah, so I'll, I'll connect dots. You no, know, in, in that regard, so um, you know, really prior to. Um, leaning heavily into um, doing exactly what you just articulated, which is standing up, you know, a formalized MAP program within the jail setting that didn't exist before, right? The, the, the culture and corrections, not only locally, but nationally was, you know, if somebody was on opioids or benzos, you know, taper them off, period, right? Once they hit a correctional setting. And then what we would see is that they would come out exactly what you're saying, we would have to restart that regiment and deal with, you know, um, the challenges in that. And, and, and it, it would be a start and stop mentality. And so we actually um, were the ones who um, were pioneers in, in a large degree of saying, no, we need to be able to get, you know, methadone treatment into the jail setting, right? We would transport it from our outpatient clinic, you know, to the jail setting to continue that care for those individuals. And so that's where I think, you know, the acknowledgement, um, you know, I'm not sure what book you read, but the acknowledgement that, you know, it, it's harmful to, to people to, to stop their treatment and then to start it back up and the need to continue that throughout the jail setting where appropriate, right? Meaning that, you know, if they haven't missed it more than three days for methadone and or seven days for, for the benzos, um, you know, that that's the best care for the patients in that setting because otherwise it's, it's, it's a challenge. Yeah. Could you explain just, I, I'm not a doctor either. <laughs> so could you explain the, what is the rationale or, or the reason why you wouldn't have them continuing if they've not been on it for, I think you said if they haven't been on it for a few days, then you, you wouldn't continue it once they were in custody. Yes, yeah, so, so uh, full disclosure, yeah. I'm not a doctor you're either. So, um, oh. uh, so you're, you're Someone get a doctor in here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, we have one actually. Um, you know, I, I, I think, um, you know, all I can tell you is what um, my understanding is that, you know, th those defined periods of time, three day, three, more than three days for methadone and, you know, more than seven days for, for benzos that, um, to start and stop when somebody hasn't had the medication in their system, there is a risk of um, a physical risk um, related to that. And so with that, that's why we, you know, make sure that we're taking people's vital signs, we're monitoring them for withdrawal, um, withdrawals on, on either substance, and, and I would throw alcohol into that as well. Um, and so, you know, we're con continually looking for withdrawal symptoms related to somebody's you know, um, uh, intake process and or issues they've identified, you know, initially as they've come into the jail. Great, and that's, thank you, that's really actually makes tons of sense, so thank you. Um, then my, my sort of last question, and then uh, I'll see the floor was just, um, so can, can you talk to us about timing then for, it sounds like you have to get the person in custody to give the request to the permission to get the information, then, um, gather that information, um, then then figure out what their treatment plan is. And it sounds like you have to do that kind of quickly, otherwise you you might end up you know outside of that three day three day window. Um, how how is that managed? So I think I'll start on this one. Um, so some of that is based on what the patient um, is able to tell us, which in most cases, if someone is in recovery and currently on, 
um, a MAT treatment program, they will tell us they need to continue that treatment program. Um, it doesn't, we are not the, the clinical folks at the, at the Denver jails is not the place they're, they're hiding that information because um, they want to have access to um, all of their medication that, that is appropriate. Um, you know, it, it becomes, it takes a little bit more time when we're looking at other things. So if we're looking at uh, blood pressure drugs or other, you know, um, cholesterol medications or other medications that, an, that someone would be on, um, we do try to verify all of those with the pharmacy, especially if they come in with that prescription um, in their possession. However, often that doesn't happen right? As we, as we know. So what we will do is they will tell us, give us the information, and then we will go and call the pharmacy and try to verify all of that information. We also, for some medications, can look in the PDMP, the Prescription Drug Monitoring Program. And of course, all of this becomes um, immensely easier if they are already in the Denver Health System and are a current patient because we have access to that. You know, that is why we are pushing so hard to get an electronic medical record within the Denver jail system. Uh, we currently do everything on paper and it has, um, it is really unfortunate that it has taken this long to be able to get uh, that process to where it is, which is cross your fingers very, very close that we are uh, currently in negotiations and getting all of the, the I's dotted and T's crossed so that we can truly help to create uh, that better care system so that we're not paper charting and doing all of that on paper anymore. Um, I have a couple more pre-questions and I'll just keep going. Um, so the sixth question was, can you speak to your approach of supporting those with psychiatric anxiety or depressive disorders, particularly those who may have been on benzodiazepine as part of their prescribed treatment prior to entry as a facility? And we talked about a little of this, but I will still read what, uh, what we had put down. As a contracted provider of healthcare services in Denver jails, we strive to provide the appropriate whole person health care to detainees. Many detainees are currently on or need medications at the time of their intake. For reasons of security and medical quality, our practice is to not accept or use pills which are brought into the jail by the detainee or family members. Instead, as part of our screening and evaluation, we determine what types of medications the detainee needs and we will provide that same medication. If that same medication is not available, a therapeutically comparable medication will be determined using our formulary. So part of that was also answered in the prior questions um, around the taper for benzodiazepines and monitoring of withdrawal systems. The seventh question was, what should the board know about Denver Health's approach to engaging with the opioid epidemic in the context of its partnership with Denver Sheriff's Department? Denver Health works closely with the DSD in acknowledging that the impacts of opioids in our community are staggering. We are committed to ensuring that the addictions treatment is the most appropriate for the patient in front of us at that time and their environment. Denver Health established the dedicated MAP program in the jails that Mark had, had spoken of to address opioids in the community and the jails. And the development of this program was done in support with one of the leading addiction psychiatrists in the country. The eighth question, is, are you familiar with the issues raised by Janet Robertson concerning the medical treatment received by her son while in custody of DSD? We are aware of the issues raised and are not able to discuss publicly the specifics of the treatment of any specific individual. And then I think, oh, the ninth, the ninth and final question was, what's the process for addressing treatment policies that are not properly followed? Can inmates or members of the public file a complaint if they believe a Denver Health employee violated po policy? If so, how is that handled? Per the jail processes and procedures, inmates are educated about the grievance process at booking and in the inmate handbook. The DSD has an entire grievance process and all of those grievances around health services go to the appropriate team. If, an, if that grievance is unresolved, it will go to the Denver Health patient advocates for those that involve the Denver Health team at the jail. An appeal may also be sent to the Denver Health Service Administrator or to the Denver Health Patient Advocate Office um, at the main hospital. How do and no, sorry. Sorry, um, how do individuals have like access to that information about their rights and um, filing of complaints? So all of that information is in the inmate handbook um, that they are given. I don't know that um, we mention it 
at every visit. I don't know what, I'd have to look into if we do any additional education. Um, I would imagine we would refer folks back to the inmate handbook if they express concern with their treatment. Um, a, a question that I have is, it's, it sounds like there is some, I don't know if medical care is the right term, but there's some care provided by the sheriff, uh, right? There's like a step down program and there, there's sort of like a little bit of something that sort of hints at what you all do and then you all do a thing. Um, I think in the, in the case of um, Ms. Robertson, there was some confusion about who's complaint process to follow and, you know, sort of like who's accountable for what thing. Um, and so can you speak a little bit to like, you know, I'm entering the, the custody of the sheriff's department. I'm, you know, having a psychotic episode. Um, you know, I, I am also on um, a, a mat treatment, right? Like what, how would I know sort of who to, who to complain to or, you know, whose problem it is? Um, and, you know, how does that sort of work its way through the process? Yeah, and I, I think the answer um, to what should be a, a simple question, I think it's actually a relatively simple answer, believe it or not. It's the same complaint process. The difference comes between if those complaints are around the care provided by health professionals those complaints will go to the health services administrator, um, which is one of our employees who is contracted to work within the Denver jails. And so then we will also have a parallel system through our patient advocate office um, as a medical facility. Um, but the, the initiating of the complaint, it starts in the same way as my understanding. So, they, so people don't have to know two processes. Helpful, thanks. Um, one more question for me. Um, so you said right at the beginning um, that you don't publish your policies and procedures. Is there a reason for that? Um, yeah, well, I mean, we're, we don't publish our, our protocols on medical care because no one publishes their protocols on medical care, right? It would be like Coke publishing their recipe. It, I mean, it's, that's the reason. Um, I think if there are specific questions on, you know, I can't speak, sorry, specific questions on specific issues, I think those can be addressed on a specific individual basis at times, but we don't generally publish all of our, our policies. Thanks. I have a question, Jackie. I mean, it seems like for well, for most of these questions, if not all of them, first of all, thank you both for your time um, and, and, uh, and, and the information. But it, it appears that for most of the questions, you, you had some prepared responses. Um, would you, are you willing to provide those to us uh, in writing so that we have them for future reference for ourselves, for any community members who may have questions, just because you provide a lot of information and it just would be good for us to have it have the have this have these responses you know in writing so that we have it um uh, let me double check with our general counsel's office um but i'm sure that we can send over the uh the responses that were prepared yeah i mean i think it's i mean since you're providing this information publicly here right. yeah, <laughs> yes. i mean it's it is it's public information so why not put it in writing so i think it will help right it'll help all of us in the future yeah thank you Other board questions? Yeah, you know, I, I guess I'm gonna just step off a cliff here and, and maybe say <laughs> something that um, hopefully I won't get in trouble for, but I, I, it's, it's really important, I, I think, you know, somebody who has really uh, been on this journey with the Sheriff's Department for, for some time, I, I've been at Denver Health for 18 years, um, it really is a collaborative relationship. And, and, and I don't know if, if that really comes through you know, in, in the way uh, and with the intentionality that, that it should. Um, we work um, uh, hand in glove with the Sheriff's Department to, to really provide the best care for persons that happen to be uh, in, in their custody. But we're looking at it from a really holistic standpoint. 
Um, we're here to serve the community uh, overall as an organization. And so we're looking at every person in the jails as a patient that um, we oftentimes are treating and will likely be treating you know, upon their release. And so really taking a look at it from the best interest of all those individuals who um, are uh, in the custody of the Sheriff's Department at that time. And, um, and, and we improve our processes all the time um, with the Sheriff's Department. It is a very open uh, relationship to where um, we challenge each other, um, and appropriately so. And um, I can say that Sheriff Diggins has been very open to our feedback and um, our recommendations anytime we bring those forward. And so I'll just, I just felt it's, it's important to know that that's an, uh, a critical relationship of ours and um, have been really supported by the Sheriff's Department in advancing that relationship. Um, Um, how are uh, inmates that have uh, eyeglasses and contact uh, supported once they're uh, in detention? Yeah, so um, as part of the medical screening, we can verify any type of, of prescription. If someone comes in with glasses, that's actually... Um, the sheriff's office takes custody of those as their possessions, and then it is their process that gets them back uh, to the individual. If someone comes in in need of corrective lenses, uh, we have an optometrist that we can set them up with and then uh, get them a pair of, of glasses at low cost. And so if they, if they come in, for example, with disposable contact lenses, then they have to go through a process of, of being assessed what their uh, corrective needs are for glasses by your your in-house uh, optometrist? No, they they don't they don't need to. I am less familiar with the contact lens question um, as to how that process would work. Um, but if they have again, if we can verify the prescription, you know, it's it's the question of. Uh, glasses versus contacts and my inability to answer your question of if someone's on daily contacts, do they come get those dailies from the medication cart or what's that process? And I actually don't have any insight into that. I didn't look into that fact um, before this. I think uh, Stefan and Katina also had questions. Um, yeah, I did. Um, actually, I just just to follow up on that, um, is, is there a way that we could get an answer to that question after this meeting or, you know, next week or sometime? I mean, yeah, actually, I OK, yeah, I know well, I, yeah. I get it. You weren't uh, you weren't informed that that was going to be a question. So I totally understand. Yeah. But I am actually I wear contact lenses. So I'm actually just related relating to that. Um, yeah, my question was just a clarifying question. I think at the beginning of your presentation, you said that you um, provide medical care on average for 971 uh, people in custody at DDC. Is that, is that what I, did I hear correctly? So per day, yes. Day, on average. Yep. Yes. Which is over, over half, well over half. Wow, yep. okay. Uh, if we're doing a numbers fun fact, because I actually just I just got these and hadn't looked at them uh, very closely. Um, but in 2021, up through the 15th of this month, we were averaging 33,272 medical visits. So. Got it. OK, thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, and just to clarify, um, as it relates to the 971 number, that is both the uh, visits at the county jail as well as the DDC. Um, and so um, we're averaging about 179 at county on a daily basis and about 792 at the DDC. So that's the combined number of both facilities. Jackie, what was that 33,272 number you just provided? I didn't catch that. Yeah, so that was the, uh, the monthly average up through the 15th of this month for 2021, 33,272. Of what? Monthly average of what? Of uh, patient visits. Oh, patient visits. I see.
So what we what we could understand now we're really doing math and, and public. <laughs> um, so what we can understand is that so you're providing care to about a thousand folks a day um, within the correctional ecosystem, and then in the total Denver Health ecosystem, you're at about thirty three thousand visits a day. So we we could understand maybe one thirtieth of your um, care is is related to this. No, these are just these are just correctional care numbers. So maybe oh, just Nicole, corrections. So okay, let me wow. I can start over because it's, yeah, start over. <laughs> we, we have so this is what's fascinating about Denver Health is we've been around for a long time and we have lots of patients. Like we see over, I think we had two over two hundred and twenty five thousand outpatient visits in twenty nineteen because uh, twenty twenty got sketchy with COVID, right? Um, so if we, we'll start again at the, at the numbers. Um, so in, okay. So our monthly average is that 33, 272 medical visits. It's at both facilities. At both facilities. The date, the, yeah. And if you annualize that out, so our people did some math, right? Which is good. It's not me. Yeah. Uh, the annualized number out of that is 399,267 visits for the year. Sure. That's just math. So we see a thousand <laughs> people a day. There are 30 days in a month. Right. That is about 30,000 visits. I got it. I'm yeah. tracking. Okay. Yeah. Great. Um, thank you. That's very helpful context. And that's a, a huge amount of care. Um, other questions from board members? If I could just make a closing comment, I, I will say that our, our medical team that provides care uh, at the Denver jails um, is truly committed and has been there for a very long time and truly does this work because they want to. And we are very appreciative again of the partnership with the city and county of Denver and with the Denver Sheriff's Department to allow um, our providers to provide care to the populations that they got in this business to provide care to. So um, they are some dedicated, wonderful people who uh, we are lucky to call part of our team. And uh, just to extend my gratitude to you all for, for coming and chatting with us. Um, you know, the, the scope of the, the COB is, is really, you know, oversight of public safety um, in the city. And um, this is obviously an important part based on the volume of care that you're, you're providing. Um, and um, yeah, it's, it's a, an enormous um, level of effort there. Um, uh, one, one quick note, um, do you have a sense of how many medical providers, doctors, nurses, et cetera, are doing that care? Um, I don't have the exact numbers right off okay. the top of my head. Um, we've obviously been impacted by uh, COVID, um, the jails, I think th this um, um, uh, group probably understands that it's been a challenging environment. So the, the level of turnover and people's willingness to work in this type of environment um, during a pandemic um, has challenged staffing. Um, and, um, but can certainly um, take that as a follow-up. That's great. Um, uh Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead, Julia. No, I was just going to wrap us up. So if you have a, another question, go ahead. Yeah, just a really a question and comment. Look, I, I completely understand, uh, Jackie and Mark, that you, you, you know, the policy not to comment on individual cases and things may be ongoing on that. You know, I, you know, I think you're aware of the fact that, you know, that Mrs. Robertson came to us with a number of concerns and the like. We would just ask, I mean, Sheriff Diggins gave us his commitment and Ms. Roberts and his commitment that he would take those concerns seriously and, and respond uh, as appropriate. And we're, we were just, we would just ask you, you know, to please, you know, commit to do, to do the same, um, even though you can't go into those details with us. She is, she is on this meeting as well um, as a, an attendee. So it's, it's worth noting she can hear your response. Yeah, no, we will um, we will ensure we work with our patient advocate office to uh, make sure that we follow up on any complaints that that we have. Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, and again, you know, really appreciate you showing up, answering our questions, um, you know, as part of our role, understanding how different parts of this ecosystem work and work together, understanding the partnership between Denver Health and the Sheriff's Department really matters and, and just the complexity of, uh, you know, the opioid epidemic, a, a pandemic, right, all of the, you know, challenges of care that, you um, folks like yourselves have today um, it is very helpful context for us. So, you know, thank you for your commitment to the city and, and for your willingness to educate us on, on the hard work that you do every day. Well, thank you for the invitation. We are happy to be the contracted medical provider for the Denver jail system. That's great, thanks. Um, uh, does the Office of the Independent Monitor have any action items or discussion topics for our public meeting today? No, I don't have anything. Okay. Thank you. Great. Um, if there are no other items from board members, we can close out um, our public meeting and um, adjourn into executive session. All right. We'll see you there. Thank you so much.